Well, hopefully this, hopefully this morning you already know where you're going to be baking your turkey or whatever you do, but because Christmas is eight days away. I mean, not that I'm counting or anything, but can you believe that? Christmas is eight days away. And we started this series two weeks ago called Making Room, a holiday season, where really we're saying what you make room for in your holiday, what you fill your calendar up, what you spend your money on, ultimately defines what Christmas is to you. What you allow into your holiday defines what your holiday is. And we've been studying the characters of the first Christmas, some characters that we don't know really a whole lot about, but we, we've noticed in this series that all of them had a choice. They had the same choice that we have to make, is we got to make room for what Christmas is really about. We started with the stepfather of Jesus. He had to make room for obedience in his life, the calling God placed on his life, and it moved him to Jesus. He had to make room for a baby. Then we, started, then we moved on to a, a group of characters, the shepherds, and they had to make room for a sign. And that sign pushed them to Jesus. And when they met Jesus and they saw Jesus, they couldn't stop talking about Jesus. And we challenged our church to tell people about what Christmas really is, to have a conversation. We said, just start with one this past week. And I pray that God gave you an opportunity to have that conversation, to tell somebody about what Christmas really means to you. And what's interesting is in a week is Christmas Eve. Probably most of you know that, but in the life of a church, Christmas Eve is one of the biggest events in the lifeblood of a church because people who really would never show up to church for some reason on the holidays on Christmas Eve will come. And so we want to leverage that and we want to equip you to have those conversations. And so we got a group of people together to bake some cookies. And when I say some cookies, I mean 7,000 cookies. So here's what they did. They baked those cookies, and a group of them were here yesterday morning packaging them. It looks like these. These are all homemade cookies. And to every single person that leaves our auditorium, you're going to get these when you walk out the doors of our auditorium. And we want you to use this as a tool. We want you to use this as a tool to start a conversation with somebody, to invite them to our Christmas Eve services. Hey, I would love for you to have some cookies and come with me. There's an invite card on here. It says to and from. And we just challenge you to use this to start a conversation. Christmas Eve, we have eight services over four locations, nine if you include the candlelight service at Arondacoit at 5 p.m. And so I want to just challenge you to use this, to engage with people who are open this time of year. But when we think about Christmas, Christmas is really tied to waiting. I mean, we're waiting on December 25th. For some of you, the waiting starts the day after Christmas. You're like, it's only 360 days until Christmas. But some of us, it starts in December, the 25 days until Christmas. And so we're waiting. And I remember even as a little kid, hoping and, and dreaming about Christmas. I made my list. I gave it to my mom and dad. And, and I couldn't wait to see and open my presents that were under the tree. And, you know, my parents would tease us. I, I feel like they were teasing us. They would wrap all the presents and put them around the tree early. And it was like, Mom, Dad, we would beg. Can we just open one, one before Christmas? And they would tell us every single time, Drew, you have to wait until Christmas. And now I have a three-year-old daughter who walks around the whole month of December, she kind of carries around with her this magazine. It's an American doll magazine. And I didn't know what the heck that was. I grew up in a family with boys. I'm like, what is an American doll? Let me tell you, I know everything about American doll right now. And Joelle walks around with this magazine. She's like, I want this, Daddy, and I, I think we could have this. And can we just open our presents now, Daddy? Let's just go to Christmas now. And I find myself saying the same things my parents said to me. Joelle, you have to wait until Christmas. And Christmas is about waiting. We're waiting on that day to come, to celebrate, to be with our family. And what's interesting is we look at the third character of the first Christmas, you'll find out he found himself in the same boat. He had to wait on the first Christmas. So if you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 is where we're going to be. You can turn there in your Bible, in your device, your iPad, whatever you have, you can follow along on the screens, or if you're using one of the Northridge Bibles, it's going to be on page 832. And as you're turning there, I just want to welcome our campuses. Thanks for being here with us. If you're joining us online or you're going to watch this later, I want to welcome all of our guests. Thank you for checking out Northridge Church. We're honored and excited that you're here this morning. And the character we're looking at this morning is probably one maybe a lot of us didn't even know played a part in the first Christmas. 
You will not find him in the nativity scene. You won't find him in most books about Christmas. He's kind of overlooked. His name is Simeon, and we pick up his story in Luke chapter 2, verse 25. It says this, Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. So who was this Simeon character? Well, it gives us a little glimpse into his story as we set the context. It says he was a man who lived in Jerusalem. And it describes him in two ways. It says he was a righteous man. A man who was in right standing with God, a man who was holy and chasing after God, he was righteous. It also says that he was devout. He was loyal. He was committed to the Old Testament law. He was committed to God. And man, if there's ever two words that I wish were said about me, those are two of them. I would love for someone to say, man, Drew is a righteous guy and he's devout. And that's the type of man Simeon was. Another thing we know about Simeon, we can kind of make this conclusion based on his story, is by the time we pick up his story, he's probably a little bit older. He's older because he's been waiting on something. In fact, we see what he's waiting on. Verse 25, it says, He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And so here in Simeon's story, we pick it up and we find him waiting and waiting. What's he waiting for? Scripture says the consolation of Israel. Well, what the heck is that? Consolation just simply means comfort. It's a word that's actually used to refer to Jesus as the comforter. And you have to understand, Simeon is, is a Jew living in Israel in this culture. And Majority of Jews thought the Messiah was coming to save them from the Roman Empire. You see, the Roman Empire was oppressing the Jews. They were taxing them. They were a government. They were putting strict restrictions on how they followed the Old Testament law. And the Jews couldn't stand the Roman Empire. And they thought Jesus was coming to be king and overtake Caesar and the entire Roman government. That's what he's waiting for. He's waiting for the day where Jesus will come and free them now. But also he's waiting on a promise, because the Holy Spirit reveals to him that one day he will see Jesus. He's one of the lucky characters who gets to lay his eyes on Jesus, and so he's promised that he will get to see Jesus. The problem is, is he has no clue when, and so he finds himself waiting. Could be a year, could be two, could be five could be 10, 50, 60 years. He has no clue. All he knows and all he can hang on to is that the Holy Spirit told him he would get to see Jesus. And so we pick up his story and he's waiting on God. And I think we can relate to Simeon because at one point in our lives, probably right now for a majority of us is we're waiting on something. And we've all waited on something, whether it's the drive through at Chick-fil-A. Can we just praise God that Chick-fil-A is coming to Rochester? (laughs) Greece Campus, I'm sorry, it's going to be closed on Sundays. But we've all waited in a drive through in traffic, at the doctor's office. But Simeon isn't waiting on something just ordinary. He's waiting on something that Jews have been waiting on for years. This is a significant weight. This is an important weight. This is a valuable weight. And the truth is, is no one likes to wait on something significant. I mean, I can't stand waiting, especially if it's important. And I think we all relate to that. Like, we don't want to wait on something that we really need. But I think a lot of us find ourselves in those shoes right now. Because we're waiting on something really important. Maybe for some of you, you're waiting on a call from a doctor to reveal to you if something's wrong or not. In fact, I just got to experience this a couple weeks ago. I flew to Houston to hang out with David and Sue Whiting. And I don't know if you've heard their story, but David and Sue, he's our old lead pastor. He's served in this church for 16 years. He's an amazing man. And as I flew to Houston to hang out with David and Sue, as I got there, they informed me that something was wrong with Emily's knee. They had no clue what was wrong. And they waited And they got the news that there was a tumor in their knee. And if you followed his blogs or my video, you know that it's cancer. And as they waited, you could see this burden they carried. You could see 
They didn't want to wait any longer. They wanted to have the answers. And some of us can relate to that because we're waiting on a doctor. Or we're waiting on our kids to come back to Jesus. We're waiting on something significant like healing for a family member. And we know how Simeon feels. Because we're waiting. And what stinks about the wait is we know there's weight in the wait. There's this burden that we carry while we wait. There's this weight that rests on our shoulders, especially when it's something significant. We feel this weight. We can't stop talking about it. We can't get it out of our head. We can't eat until we know the answer because there's a burden we carry. In fact, I've, I've lived this out in my life. You see, Ashley and I, we were engaged and I had a year left in Bible college and she just graduated nursing school. And our plan for the first year of marriage was she was going to be a nurse and she was going to support our family while I finished Bible school. And so as she graduated nursing school, she had one thing left to check off the list. She had to pass her state exam. And so she studied and studied and studied and the day came where she would take that exam. And so I went with her and I sat in the waiting room and she went to take the test. She told me it would be an hour. And so an hour goes by and I'm kind of like, on the edge of my seat because this is how we're like planning for our future. Like if she doesn't pass this test, um, we're going to be in trouble. So an hour goes by and Ashley doesn't show up. And so another hour goes by and another hour goes by and another hour goes by. Four hours later, I'm like, is she dead? (laughs) She comes out and I'm like, did you pass? Like what? Are we going to make it? Oh, Drew, I forgot to tell you, we're going to have to wait six weeks for the results. (laughs) What? You did not tell me that. And those six weeks were agonizing. I mean, I I called her every day, hey, have you heard the news? And we've been there before, waiting on something significant. We carry that weight around like, oh, I just need to know. I just got to know what's going to happen. And Simeon, he's probably got to this point with God, like, God, I'm getting older. I feel like I'm about ready to die, and I think I was right. You promised me that I'd get to see Jesus, but I don't feel like Jesus is coming. Like, have you forgotten about me, God? Like, what happened to the promise you made me? I've been waiting for a long time. Because there's weight in the wait. And here's what Psalm says about waiting. Psalms 27, verse 14, it says, Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. And this verse Man, I wish it was encouraging, but it's just, it's just reality. Is you're, there's going to be a season in your life where you're going to have to wait on God. And in fact, the, the scripture says you've got to be strong and take heart because you're going to wait on God and you're going to want God to answer you and you're going to desperately need it. And he's going to say, be patient, and you're not going to like it. And it's going to be hard. And scripture says, take heart, hold on, and be strong because you will have to wait on God. And that's where Simeon is. He's waiting on a promise. But what he doesn't see and what we often don't see when we wait is God's activity. We're blinded to it because we're so laser focused on what we're waiting for and what we need. We fail to back up and see God's sovereignty and what God is doing while we wait. And I want you to understand something today. Maybe you're waiting on something like Simeon. You're waiting on a promise from God. You're waiting for God to intervene. And I want you to understand that God works for you while you wait. God is working for you in the midst of your wait. We can't see it. We don't know what's happening. But God is aligning the the full picture of the story. And we're going to get to see this in Simeon's story. As he waits, as he maybe grows frustrated with God, as he is like, God, come on, you promised me. God was doing something greater than Simeon could ever imagine. He was working and he was putting the pieces of the puzzle together. And this is what Isaiah says, 64 verse 4. It says, since ancient times, no one has heard No ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you. And here's this line. It says, who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. God will work while you wait. Even if you grow impatient, even if you get tired of waiting, God will continue to do what he only can do. So early on in Simeon's story, this is the, the moment where he has to make room. This is the moment in his life where he has to make room for something that really none of us want to make room for. He's been given the promise, hey, you're going to see Jesus. Now he has to make room for the wait. 
He has to make room for the journey, and he doesn't know if it's going to be a year or a hundred years. He has no clue. But at some point in his life, he has to make room for God's timing in his life. And that's just not something we like to make room for in our lives. It's like, okay, God, uh, here's what I need, and here's the timeline I'm going to give you. Okay? Ready, go, God. We don't like to make room for the wait. No one likes to wait. But we're going to have to wait on God, and Simeon right here has to make room for God's promise to come true in his life, not knowing when it will happen, and if it will happen the way he thinks it will happen. And he's here, what he's going to discover just in a little bit in the story that And something that we need to discover is Jesus is worth the wait. What God is doing in your life is worth the wait. When you make room for God's wait in your life, it's interesting how he shapes you and he transforms you while you wait. And the wait is worth it. And let me just clarify what I mean by when I say worth it. Because when you make room for the wait and it will be worth it, I don't mean God's going to do what you want, when you want it, and how you want it. Because it rarely happens that way. Man, I wish I could tell you today, when you wait on God, if you're just patiently, he'll do exactly what you want. It would be perfect. But that never happens. Because God knows better than we do. And it's worth it because we get to wait on God to do something greater than we could even picture or imagine. And that's what he does in this story. Verse 27, it picks up. It says, moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And I think... For a lot of us, we view this as a, it's setting the scene, but man, I think we miss something in scripture when we overlook this, this part of the story. And I would encourage you, as you read your Bible, when you're studying God's word, don't miss on these, these small little words that are really powerful in our lives today. It says, moved by the Spirit. And I think that's so significant because it gives you a glimpse into the kind of guy Simeon was. It says, the Spirit spoke and he was moved. He was sensitive to God's work inside of his own heart. And I think sometimes in in, in the the holiday season, especially this time of year, we get so busy. We get so busy in, in the holidays. We get so busy in putting up our trees and buying presents and doing all the traditional things of Christmas. We fail to realize and listen to the voice, that still small voice that says, hey, you should have that conversation. Hey, you should invite that person to church. Simeon was moved by the Spirit. He was sensitive to what the Spirit was telling him. And I think sometimes we get so busy and our our lives get so loud that we miss that small voice that guides us, that pushes us. He says he was moved by the Spirit, so he went to the temple courts. This is when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was custom of the law required. So let me set the scene for you. Simeon's somewhere in Jerusalem. And the spirit moves in his heart, so he heads to the temple. Now, on the other side is Mary and Joseph. Jesus has already been born. He's 30 days old. And we know he's 30 days old because, according to the Old Testament law, at 30 days, the parents had to come to the temple and offer sacrifices to consecrate the firstborn child back to the Lord. So again, you see God working in the midst of Simeon's wait. Mary and Joseph are headed to the temple. They have no clue Simeon's about to join them. Simeon's over here in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit moves in his life, and he's headed to the to temple. And God is creating this holy collision that he promised to Simeon. And fine, we, we see it in verse 28. It says this, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. It was that moment Simeon had waited for. Here it is. He walks to the temple. He has no clue Jesus is going to be there. And then he sees him. Puts him in his arms. And the first things that come out of his mouth are sovereign Lord, just as you've promised. And here's what it tells us. Here's what it reminds us. Is that God is always... God is always faithful to do what he says he will do. God always comes through. Even if it's at the last moment, even when you think he's forgotten about you, God is always faithful to do what he says. And if he says it, you can bank on it. You can guarantee it. And I don't know about you today, but I am so glad that I serve a God who is faithful, who has never let me down and always comes through right when I need him. He's faithful. He does things at the perfect timing. 
So Simeon is moved to the point when he sees Jesus. He's so completed by this moment. He looks up to God and he says, I don't need anything else. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to enter your presence, God, because I just laid eyes on Jesus, and Jesus is all I need, so you can take me. Take your servant in peace. But before he does that, Simeon says some things about Jesus. Verse 30, it says, For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of all your people Israel. Now, this is really interesting. I think this is fascinating because, remember, Simeon was waiting on the consolation of Israel. And so he's waiting for Jesus to come back and establish his kingdom now. That was what he was waiting for. But it's not what he gets. And it's interesting, as he lays eyes on Jesus, his perspective begins to change. Because when he lays his eyes on Jesus, he says, wow, now I see it differently, God. I see your salvation, not just for Israel, but for all nations. A light to the revelation to the Gentiles and all of Israel. See, Simeon thought he was waiting on a gift for Israel. But now he sees Jesus and he realizes God is doing something so much bigger. What I actually wanted wasn't exactly what we needed. What I desired for wasn't really what God wanted to do. And it wasn't really what I needed. And it led me to this question. It really led me to this place is what I'm asking for, really what I desire. He continues, and it's interesting. It says, the child's father and mo mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the failing and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against. So the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. A sword will pierce your own soul too. It's fascinating that Mary and Joseph, when they hear Simeon saying these things about Jesus, that they marveled. And I, it never made sense to me, because Mary and Joseph were told who Jesus was at the beginning. I mean, we looked at Joseph's story. He was told that this, this boy would be the savior of the world. He came to save people from their sins. So they knew who Jesus was, but it says they marveled at what Simeon was saying. And it's almost as God reaffirms in them through another human. It wasn't an angel this time, but it was a human being saying, look who this baby is. And that word marveled is really interesting because it's only used twice in all of Scripture. Here at Jesus' first coming, and then secondly at his second coming. First Thessalonians verse 1, verse 10, it says, On the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. So Simeon sees it differently now. What I've been waiting for and what I've desired wasn't what I needed. But God gave me what I needed in Jesus. And that led me to a question that I think I, I want to ask you that I've been asking myself because I think a lot of us are waiting on something. But is what you are waiting for what you really need? Is what you are desiring and what you are waiting for really what you need? Because I think, I think a lot of times we, we believe this. We believe if God would just give us the desire of our heart, that it would give our lives some form of satisfaction some form of completion. You see, some of us are waiting on a baby. We've tried. It's not working out. And so we're praying to God, God, please provide for our family. We want a baby. And we think if we have that baby, it will give us uh, some significance as a, as a woman, as, as, a, as a dad. Some of us are waiting on healing from God. We're, we're waiting on God to come through and, and heal someone we love or ourselves. And we think if God comes through, it will give us purpose. It will give us significance. Some of us are waiting on a spouse or a raise. And we think like, God, just, just give me this desire and it will satisfy me. And the truth is, is it will. For a season. For a moment. But eventually, that baby will start to cry. Eventually, that spouse that you want will annoy you. It's true. All you're married, you're like, yeah, it's true. <laughs> eventually, that raise will get old, and you'll want more. And what will happen is what you waited for, you got, and it satisfied you for a season, but then it led you to a place where now you're waiting on something else to satisfy you. 
And right here, Simeon, as he looks at Jesus, he realizes that this is what we need. Jesus' birth signified the, the end to our greatest need. Jesus' birth was just the beginning of God doing something bigger that Simeon couldn't even imagine, that he was getting ready to end our need in general. Because we all, at some place in our life, needed something. But Jesus' birth ended that need. Romans 6, 23 says it like this. It says, for the wages of sin is death. Man, that's exciting news. Woo! We're going to die. Awesome. Glad I came to church today, right? The Bible says we're all sinners. Every single one of us. From the preacher to every single person. We've all messed up. And the penalty of that sin is death. And it's not just physical death, but it's spiritual death. It's that our sin will cause us separation from God. Eternity without a loving Savior. That is where our sin pushed us to. And that was our direction. But. But. But Christmas happened. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And some of us are waiting. And I'll just tell you the truth today. Without Jesus in your life, you will be waiting on something to satisfy you that only he can give you. Amen. You will always be waiting on something. The next best thing. Maybe Christmas in the presence. You will always be waiting. You will live in this vicious cycle where you think something of this world can satisfy you and give you hope and meaning and purpose. And it will for a season, but then eventually it will run dry and you will move on to the next thing that will satisfy. And I would ask you, are you tired of living in that cycle? Are you tired of searching and searching for the things of this world that are going to satisfy you, but eventually just leave you empty. I'm telling you today, the only place you will ever find satisfaction, full satisfaction, is at the cross of Jesus Christ. At the cross where Jesus gave up his life to say, I love you. And so why are we looking for things for satisfaction? Why are we chasing down things that eventually will leave us dry? You'll always be waiting. Without Jesus, you will always be waiting on something that only he can give you. So why not surrender to him? So why not give your life to him? You see, knowing Jesus is not this complex equation. It's not some thing you got to figure out your life and, and you got to get it all right before Jesus will accept you. No, the gospel is clear. That Jesus loves you for who you are right now, today. He doesn't expect you to get it all together. He just expects you to realize that you are a sinner, that you've messed up, and that you need him. He is who he says he was, and that you want to surrender your life to him. It's a heart's cry to a savior, to a dad, to redeem us and restore us. Man, if you're here today and you don't know Christ, I would urge you, I'd beg with you to talk to somebody. To, don't leave our auditoriums without talking to a campus pastor your community group leader, the person who brought you. Because with Jesus, he will give you all that you need. But yet for us as Christians, we've made that decision. We've made that decision to follow Jesus. And so the question for us is we all still wait on things. We are all like Simeon. We wait on significant things. So how do we wait well? How do we nav navigate this waiting journey that we all go through? Scripture says we're going to wait on God. So how do we do it well? And I think it's as simple as this. As Christians, we wait well by realizing Christ is all we need. And I know that sounds so churchy and so cliche, but here's what I find so many Christians, and I am so guilty of this, is just because we know Jesus doesn't mean that we don't hope in other things. I'm so guilty of thinking like, God, if you would just give me this, man, I would be complete. God, if you would just give me this next and best thing, like, oh, man, it would just take my life to the next level. And I'm saying as Christians, the way we wait well is we say and we declare to God, God, you can make my life crazy. You can take away every good thing that I have because the only thing that I need in this life is you. 
And so I might not get any presents this Christmas. I might not even buy my kids presents this year. But that doesn't matter because my hope and everything that I am is found in you, Jesus. And that's how we wait well as Christians is we don't bank and we don't hope in things of this world to give us satisfaction. We find it in Jesus. Man, when we find it in Jesus, that's where we feel fulfilled. That's when things of this world we don't need because we realize we have all we need. And man, in Christmas, this season, and what it is, a baby's born, a savior's born. What better way to wait well than by remembering what Christmas is all about? That Jesus left heaven and he came down to love us. He entered a messy world full of sinners and he loved us enough to go to the cross and sacrifice everything so that we could have life and have it to the fullest. And so I thought what better way to do that than to remember Christ's sacrifice through an object lesson that we call communion. Scripture says, do this in remembrance of me. And so today at all of our locations, we're gonna celebrate communion. We're gonna celebrate what this baby came to do to sacrifice the blood that was shed and his body that was broken for us. So a couple things about communion that I want you, you to know is one, it's for believers. It's for people who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, who have made them the forgiver of their sins and the leader of their life. And so if you haven't done that, man, don't leave here today without making that decision, but communion isn't for you. But it's also a time for us as Christians to really examine our lives, to examine our Christmas and say, what is Christmas really about to me? Is it about that my saviors came or is it about everything else culture is about? What sins in my life that is keeping me from being God's best for my life? It's a chance to just really look inward. God, am I all that I need to be? A chance to have ask for forgiveness and to really say, hey, God, I want Christmas to be about you this year. So our band's gonna come and sing a song and our volunteers are gonna pass out the elements and I would just challenge you to peel that tab off and wait, we're gonna take communion together. But as we celebrate Christmas, we don't celebrate the things of this world. We celebrate the fact that our Savior is here. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for being generous. Thank you that you loved us enough to put your life on the line. And God, I pray for those who are questioning who Jesus is. God, I pray that you would reveal yourself to them, that you'd make it clear, that you'd make it evident, and that they wouldn't leave here today without placing their faith and their trust in you, that you would radically change their reality, God. And God, I pray for us who are following Jesus that you would give us this moment of just reflection in our life, that you'd open our eyes and our hearts to the sin that's holding us back and that you would allow us to confess it to you. And God, that this Christmas wouldn't be about anything but you. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.